Dear students, my video is a tutorial guide for all students of English literature who are pursuing their UG courses from any university in India. I will discuss a topic on Alexander Pope's famous mock epic, The Rape of the Law. Today's topic is the character of Belinda in the light of the morning dream and the toilet scene. So here I begin. Sometime during the summer of 1711, the circle of prominent Catholic families in the home counties was disturbed by the rash act of Robert, 7th Lord Peter, in removing part of a coffer from a famous beauty, Arabella Firmer. The cutting of Miss Bell Firmer's hair was taken too seriously causing an estrangement between the two families, a common acquaintance and well-wisher to both families, John Carrill, an intimate friend of Alexander Pope, desired him to write a poem to make a jest of it and laugh them together again. Pope attached a preface to his literary genius, The Rape of the Lock, 1714, a dedication to Mrs. Arabella Former, stating that his Belinda resembles her in nothing but in her ineffable beauty and that he always named the loss of her hair with reverence. The characters of a mock heroic poem are necessarily caricatures of familiar social types rather than sharply individualized, lifelike personalities. For the object of the mock heroic, a poet has to dress the pygmies of his time in the robes of epic heroes and titanic personalities to bring out the discrepancy between the petty reality and the gigantic pretensions. Though the characters of the rape of the law were derived from contemporary society, Pope had to pine explaining in his prefatory epistle to Arabella the historical origin of his Belinda. Pope was a chauvinist and his own experience in love was that of a baffled wooer which might be traced as a backdrop which instigated him to perceive an embittered picture of women as full of triviality. The society in which the poem is wrought is patriarchal, where women's position is clearly defined with restraints, but Pope's Belinda tries to transcend them. The Rape of the Lock is a neat picture of the feminine follies of the upper social strands and of the gay, idle gallantries and luxuries of the male counterparts. The poem lacks sweetness as Pope himself declares the purpose of the poem is to laugh at the little unguarded follies of the female sex. Pope does not simply laugh at it but takes an offensive banter beneath a thin film of wit and pleasantry. The Rape of the Lock introduces the readers to a typically little world of fashions and frivolities obsessed with its gaiety, dressing, flirting, card playing in the old London of Queen Anne. Belinda is the heroine of the glittering but hollow and abject world. She is the pivot around whom the gay world of vanity and luxury move with its show men and women leading lives of ostentatious dainties. Belinda is compared to the sun. Pope suggests that the sun recognizes in Belinda the rival of his beams and fears her. The sun god Saul pours into Belinda's bedroom a timorous ray through the white curtains suggesting her chastity. The brilliance of her eyes makes the sun rays shy. This hyperbole 
is introduced to give the poet an opportunity to mock at the polite cliché. Belinda's comparison to the sun again occurs in the poem in the opening of Canto 2, where we find an instance of Elizabethan hyperbole. She set forth on the bosom of the silver Thames, bestowed with greater glory than the sun rising over the crimson horizon. She is like the sun, not only because of her bright eyes and domination over her special world, but because of her generous munificence with which she shines on all alike. Pope's manner here is of a compliment, but there is an ironic tone where he reflects the inconstancy of her character. She is a coquette who desires to be admired, but is never willing to give her heart to anyone. As Belinda rouses, her lap dogs too shake off their drowsiness and move their limbs. Belinda rises from slumber like sleepless lovers who spend sleepless nights at midday, rings her handbell, thrice to call her maids at her service, and strikes a slipper against the floor, impatient, not getting any response. Belinda pressed the repeater clock again to know the time, thinking that it is too early for her to be up. Waking up so late, she does not disdain to supplement the extended hours of her sleep by an additional dose. She presses her soft cozy pillow and falls back to the embrace of slumber. Pope here suggests that this is not merely her laziness, but the pervading influence of a guardian sylph, Ariel, who prolonged the balmy rest. Ariel figures in her dream in disguise, calculated to interest Belinda as a fashionable and aristocratic gallant, dressed up as for a ceremonious occasion, such that Belinda blushes even in her slumber. Ariel lowers his seductive lips on her ear and whispers as in illusion. Here the poet directs our attention to the concept of phantasm, the one in which Belinda dwells, taking life to be full of vanity and the reality she knows that chastity is something to guard. The situation is reminiscent of Milton's Satan injecting into the years of Eve seeds of temptation. Ariel addresses Belinda as fairest of mortals who is the object of special care and protection by the bright airy spirits. Belinda is always made conscious of a power as a great beauty by Ariel to rejuvenate her pride each time. Belinda has only attained physical maturity. At the bottom, her mind is unripe. Ariel manipulates this immaturity of hers and urges her to give him a heedful ear if ever a vision touched her pure thought of infancy, of the tales that nurses and priests, the chief inlets of superstition, had taught about fairies in moonlight, leaving silver coins in the slippers of dutiful servants to keep their house clean and enclosures where fairies danced at night or about virgins being visited by angel powers, an illusion when Mother Mary was attended by angels to deliver that she was to be the Christ's mother. Belinda seems to be unaware of her exclusive status, which she is reminded of by Ariel, suggesting her not to bound her narrow views to mundane things. Ariel makes sure that Belinda is not skeptical about the angelical powers, for it is to those pure and virtuous 
to maids alone and children do the airy spirits reveal some surreptitious truths which learned wits doubt ariel does his best to draw belinda away from the world of reality to illusion ariel pierces into her mind her importance such that innumerable ariel spirits forming a light militia though unseen always attend on her some guarding her in the opera others her carriage ride in hyde park belinda does not really need to bother about the sedan chair and her pages as she has a grand escort of dynamic spirits to attend her pope acquaints us of the transmigration of soul as found in ovid's metamorphoses the spirits who then attended belinda were in their lifetime of the same woman's beauteous mold pope frivolously suggests here that with death people's vanity do not die out though after physical decay they no more play cards but their pleasures derived from the joy of riding gilded chariots and love of amber still remains when women die they are reduced to the four elements fire air earth and water the women with violent ill-tempered nature become salamanders soft gentle submissive souls become aquatic nymphs and sip with their companion their elemental tea the women of affected modesty who do not marry to retain their purity become gnomes the frivolous flirtatious women become sylphs who fly freely in the fields of air ariel informs belinda that whoever fair and chaste do not respond or submit to the advances of men and reject men's offers of love are always guarded by sylphs in the shape of men for spirits once freed from terrestrial bonds can assume any sex or shape they want pope deliberately creates an ambiguity on the actual sex of ariel who is a sylph in the shape of a man once a coquettish lady ariel gives belinda a proper understanding of how important he is in her life he tells her that when frail fickle minded women give in to their lovers and risk their virginity in courtly balls and midnight masquerades where treacherous gay lovers cast sly glances by day and whisper love in dark finding favorable opportunities which excite their lascivity due to the soft melting notes of music and dancing the sylphs protect them from their hands but here too men take up the credit of saving the maiden through their honor pope has not used the word honor in its conventional connotation of one's understanding of one's position with due regard to morality but as hollow reputation ariel reaches the summit of exaggeration according to him there are girls having an over estimation of their beauty fated by characters to be under gnomes influence but the gnomes misguide them by giving the girls a high expectation of extravagant marriages intensifying their pride the girls fancy to have become wives of peers dukes all their sweeping train and garters stars and coronets and to have been addressed as your grace for ariel 
it is the sole monopoly of belinda to reject proposals but for lesser beauties they must accept them as chances never come back pope is ironical here through ariel for whom belinda's pride is permissible for she is the fairest of mortals according to ariel if a female soul is tempted too early to roll their eyes to blush by putting on mere embellishments like rouge to fly at a beau a fashionable gallant she runs the risk of losing her chastity if under the influence of a gnome ariel claims that the sylphs guide the maids through intricate ways through the worlds of pleasure but pope actually means the contrary that the sylphs lead them from one trifle to another ariel explains the weakness of women as there is no lady who does not surrender her virtue to a new lover unless that is counteracted by a dance party arranged by a previous love when florio an imaginary fashionable gallant whispers erotic notes in the ears of a virgin another da mon imaginary gallant seduces her away by shaking hands such is the inconstancy of a female heart felicitously compared to the moving toy shop pope has exercised an excellent metonymy in objectifying men of vanity to trivialize them wigs with wigs with sword knots sword knots strive bears with new wigs knots coaches compete with the old ones and oust them from the maiden's affection ariel suddenly leaps up with his identity to be one of the guardian spirit a watchful sprite ariel by name while ranging in the transparent ariel desert ariel claims to have seen in the mirror of destiny some impending peril ready to befall on belinda before sunset ariel breaks his spell in belinda's dream with a last warning to beware of all but most man on awakening from her dream belinda sits in her toilet room decking herself almost with religious zeal her eyes first opens on a billedou the first love letter she had received full of conventional sighs and warmth of feelings pope then focuses the camera of his perfection on the ladies dressing table where the toilet stands displayed each of the silver vases carrying powder lay arranged in a mysterious way known to ladies only as if it were a place of worship she first robes in white a carrier of her chastity belinda is the chief priestess who adores her heavenly image in the mirror the goddess who is no one else but she her narcissism reaches such heights that she ends up worshiping herself at the shrine of her beauty the dressing table the violation of logic involved is intended as belinda is a goddess who puts on her divinity at her dressing table and the paradox is that she is simultaneously the sincere devotee and divinity herself the inferior priestess 
her maid Betty assists her in the sacred rites of pride. In the 18th century thought, pride remained the first of sins. By making it sacred, Belinda is obviously guilty of a serious moral fault. Innumerable items of beautification stand bare at once on the dressing table and from the various objects of embellishments the maid gathers with careful labor and decors Belinda with gems and other sparkling things. One casket exposes India's glowing gems, the other perfumes of Arabia and tortoise and elephant after undergoing a small Ovidian metamorphosis is transformed to her combs. Pope digs out Belinda's limited purview of the limited microcosmic world with no knowledge of its macrocosm. The spacious world enters her dressing room only in a serviceable and diminished form. Pope draws a climax in the arrangement of the items in a dressing table, puffs, powders, patches, bibles, billidoo. The expansion of small into vast is effected in the pins extending into shining rows or files of soldiers. Belinda here becomes the epic hero in armor as well as awful beauty, ready to combat her infatuated lovers. Belinda's beauty and charm are calculated. She is a conscious and consummate artist who perfects the portrait of herself by improving the quality of her smiles, awakening every grace and calling forth all wonders of her face. She gradually arouses a purer blush which might not be ironical to mean impurer but may be a blush recollected in tranquility, thus purer than that spontaneously overflowing with emotion, and keener flash in her eyes as part of her defense mechanism before combating with the handsome bios. The selves do it all, taking care of their favorite ward, Belinda, adjusting her head, dividing her hair, folding her sleeve, plating her gown, but unfortunately the maid servant Betty snatches all the credit. When Belinda moves in her pleasure boat on Thames, she reminds us of the power of Cleopatra's beauty in the barge on the Niles. She wears a sparkling cross on her white breast, not dictated by religion, but as a mere object of beautification, which even Jews and heathens would kiss and adore. Pope here does not miss the chance to have an indirect dig on flirtatious men. Her faults are completely obliterated in the eyes of the onlookers because of her graceful ease and sweetness. Belinda nourishes her two locks gracefully hung in equal curls to the destruction of mankind. Pope employs an Elizabethan hyperbole in stating Belinda's curly locks decks her ivory white neck. Belinda's hair, though slender, has such a potency that they imprison the mighty hearts of infatuated lovers in its labyrinthine convolutions. Pope plays a note of bathos in bringing men, birds and fish 
in the same platform to reinforce the magic of Belinda's hair which traps men like birds in the hairy springes and catches them like fish in the delicate net of her hair. Men supposed to be a stronger sex, more imperial of human race are all ensnared by a single hair of Belinda. Pope is here entirely clear-sighted to allow the charming Belinda as surely the innocent victim of a rude assault, but the baron may be even the victim rather than the aggressor ravished by Belinda's locks to tempt him to seize it. Belinda's smile makes all the world gay, but she enthralls men superficially, which can never gain her a true admirer of her inner womanhood. Belinda has got all her priorities wrong. Chastity is one of her most becoming garments. It gives her her retinue of airy guardians. As a proper maiden, she will keep from staining it just as she will keep from staining her new brocade. Its very fragility is part of its charm and Pope becomes symbolist in suggesting it. Pope suggests that chastity is like fine porcelain, somewhat brittle, precious, useless and prone to be broken. He also hints similarly that honour is something pretty, airy, fluid to the spirits, so they haste to protect it. Pope's vessel imagery in his poem has a particularly rich background. There can be no doubt after reading the poem that Pope had a special power of observing the little weaknesses in all persons, especially women of rank and fashion. Belinda, Pope's heroine, stands as a representative of the 18th century Elizabethan aristocratic ladies with all the vanities, frivolities and fashions of her social type. As in his essay of women, Pope had frankly opined that every woman is at heart a rake. But Pope's attitude towards Belinda is highly ambiguous and complex. Though he satirizes the shallow morality and confusion of values which characterizes Belinda and her circle, but at the same time he emphasizes her feminine charm and appeal. There is indeed something lovable and endearing in her character which no irony can entirely undermine. Contemporary critic Dennis found fault in Pope's delineation of Belinda's character, saying that she is no character but a chimera in its derogatory sense. However, this can well be converted to a compliment because Belinda is indeed a chimera, an imaginary comic heroine out of a real-life woman, Arabella Firma. Students, thanks for watching. I hope this video is able to help you with framing your answers on the character of Belinda. Please like, comment, share and subscribe to my channel for more tutorial videos and please mention the topics you want to be discussed in the comment section.